Segabits presents Sega Talk, a podcast talking all things with your hosts, George and Barry. Look, it's a giant talking egg. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the master here. So what's Hello and welcome to Sega Talk. I'm Barry. With me is George. Hello, everyone. And we are kicking off February. We're going to be calling it Kenji Eno Month because uh, we are going to be covering two games from the late, great game designer and musician. So why did we pick February? Well, um, as it turns out, uh, eight years ago, as of February 20th, it would have been the eight-year anniversary of his untimely passing at the age of 42. Think about that. 42. Crazy. Um, he would have been 50 this year, which, uh, it's kind of sad. Um, it really is. He, that's not yeah. at all either. No. And I mean, I, I don't want to be grim or anything, but the, the dude made some pretty grim games. So maybe he'd, I don't know, appreciate that we are, we're celebrating this right now. Um, yeah. so I'm going to be talking about D George is going to be talking about D two on the next episode. And between the two, you're going to get a good idea of the type of guy he was, the type of games he made. Um, I'm going to be covering his history up into up until the release of D, and then George's going to I'm going to pass off the football. Right, that's what they do. They pass yeah. the football. Um, I know there's On, a big the uh, yeah, the American sports football. game. Yeah, exactly. And he'll take it from there. So before we get into it, we are on Patreon. Um, you can support us at any level and leave your memory at the end of the show. I was about to say game. I'm I'm so <laughs> gamed up right now. Um, you can also pick episodes that we uh, show. See, now I just got them mixed up again. You can pick games that we cover. And, you know, it's a fun little community. I like it. You like it. We like those guys and girls over there. Um, so let's dive right into it. Like I said, we're dedicating this whole month to Kenji Eno. Passed away. Um, he has a small gameography, and he has very unorthodox games and a rebellious marketing techniques that made him a notable figure in the industry. And his passing brought about, at least for me, a renewed interest in his works. I mean, not many people were talking about, um, I don't know, real sound, you know, the game for the deaf um, yeah. until he passed. And then people, people were like, oh, the dude made D, D2, Enemy Zero. And he made a game for the deaf. So, I mean, again, it's it's so sad that he passed away, but I'm, I'm very happy that so many people pay attention to him um, and play his games. D, D was a horror game developed by Warp and released in April 1995 for the Saturn, PlayStation 3DO, and DOS. It's similar to games like Mansion of Hidden Souls and Myst. Have you played either one of those, George? I played um, Myst. That's about it. I think everybody's tried Mist, right? One time in their yeah. life. Yeah. And if they haven't, they lie and say they did. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I've played both of those. Mansions of Hidden Souls, I, I would actually say is very close to D, just in terms of the like creepy house, strange, surreal things happening to you. Mm. Um, I, I would recommend checking out if you like D, though it's uh, not as grimdark as D is. Um, D allowed players to move through pre-rendered full motion video environments and featured adventure game elements. But unlike the two games I mentioned, the game also featured some very unique gameplay, which I will get to, as well as some truly scary moments. Um, so George, when did you first become aware of Kenji Ino, uh, Warp, and the game D? So, uh... Kenji Eno, when I first heard of him, was most mostly when like they were hyping up the Dreamcast a lot. <clears throat> he was part of that kind of uh, rock star developer that would do these interviews. That you were like, "Who is this guy?" And then you would like look more into, you know, his history and stuff. He would mm-hmm. make some like outlandish claims. He was very <clears throat> anti Sony for a while. What it seemed like. As for yeah. uh, D, I uh, found out about it. Way before I knew about him, because it was like one of the first Sega Saturn games I owned. Because when I traded, when I was a kid and I traded my Nintendo 64 for a Sega Saturn, I don't know if it was the smartest move in the world, really, looking back at it. But uh, 
this is one of the games the kid had with it. It was like a Madden game I never cared about and some sports game and then like Daytona. And mm-hmm. then this one, I, I he told me that his dad bought it. You know, remember back in the 90s when you had those magazines where you would be able to buy stuff on credit and then yeah. they would ship you that thing and then they would like rip you off because the payments would be way more than the actual thing is worth. Right. His dad used to scam it. So he ha- he got it for free. His dad was a scammer. So he didn't care <laughs> about it. He didn't like the Sega Saturn. He didn't even like video games. So he just traded me up for the Nintendo 64 so he could play uh, Smash Brothers. Of and course. this is one of the first games he had on it. And this is one of the first games I've ever played that was like Mist. And at first I didn't get it. So it took me a while to actually get back into it and try to beat it and figure mm. out the puzzles. And I didn't really figure it out because I'm too dumb, you know? So I had to find a guide, and then I used the guide to beat the game. But oh, wow. even though I don't I don't think the game is that hard, I don't know. What do you what do you think about it? You said you played it this weekend, right? Uh, yeah, so I, I've always been aware of the game. I think it's kind of hard not to if, you're a, if you are a Saturn owner. Even if you don't own the game, you know the big red D on the cover. And you're like, what what is this all about? We've got this like woman like crying black oil. Uh, big red D on the cover. And then, of course, you make the jokes that, like, I made this week on Twitter where I'm like, um, you know, the, the weirdest dual, duology of video games ever where it's like D and then D2, the Mighty, Di- Mighty Ducks strike <laughs> Mighty- back. So, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's just, it's it's a weird name. And I think that works because, I mean, if they called it anything else, you know, like Blood Monster, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that, that weird game blood monster i remember that but like d it just it stands out because it's simple it's mysterious it's weird um and as we'll get to the meaning behind it i'm glad they didn't go with what it meant for meant otherwise maybe they'd be in some uh i don't know if they'd be in any legal trouble but there's definitely some games that would compete with them (laughs) with the title yeah um Um, i would say maybe b could have been another title they could have used for this one for blood um, or C for cannibal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as for Kenji, Eno, I, I was aware of him, but I wasn't aware of um, him as much until his passing. And mm-hmm. I think that's just because so many people were writing about him. So many people are mentioning, you know, what he had done. Um, and I, I, I have all of his games here. I have his whole, most of his games. Uh, here's four of them. So I have D I have enemy zero and then I have Real Sound here, and then I have D2. And as you'll notice, uh, it's all Japanese Saturn games and then the American Dreamcast uh, version of the, D2. Do you have the full package for Real Sound, the one with all the weird stuff like the, the yeah, Braille? Yeah, it's all, it's all in here. Yeah, yeah it's complete. Nice. And I honestly, I think I did get Real Sound before he passed away. Because I remember hearing, oh, there's a, a game for the blind on the Dreamcast. And I thought, oh, I want to get that. And then I saw that the the Saturn one was significantly cheaper. So I picked that up. And I never really made the connection that he was behind that and that he w- made the game D. I was also aware of D2 before he passed away. I picked this up um, probably maybe late 2000s um, when I was still living in Philadelphia. So... You know, like, I was aware of him, but I just was not aware of what made up his gameography. And now that, you know, I've gone through and, and researched him and learned more about him, it, it's just, he's a really interesting guy. And oh, yeah. I think he had so much more to give to the industry, and it's just so tragic that he passed away when he did. I don't know if he would be the next Yu Suzuki, but I definitely think he'd be up there with some of the, the greats in terms of people who are unorthodox in their game development and are kind of a little strange, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It um, kind of reminds me of that guy that did that, uh, what's that Namco game? The one where you're the little guy that does the ball. Um, oh, um, te- Katamari Damacy. Damase. Yeah. And then he's yeah, done yeah. like other games where like, it's like random, like you got to go to the moon, the Nobby Nobby boy or whatever. Right. And yeah. It's, like, it's just, yeah, yeah. It's and I, I could games. totally see, if he was still alive in, like, 50 this year, I could see them going, like, he has a, like, PlayStation, like, courted him. And they're like, listen, we're giving you a big exclusive. You know, I, I could see that. Or I could see him being big with Xbox, to be honest. 
um, given his history, he might be like, no, screw Sony. I only make Xbox games. And then he was and then Microsoft. always an outsider. Yeah, exactly. And so let, let's talk about him for a little bit. Um, okay. Kenji Eno, he long had an interest in video games, which began with 1978 Space Invaders. The game made him want to develop his own game so he could start a career and get more into producing synth and techno music, which he could not afford at the time. And I, okay. I, I in my <laughs> research, I couldn't really understand that. So I think what it was, was he was like, I'm going to make money so I can buy the equipment to make the music I want to make. So it so almost felt he like... Was, he, like yeah. video games were just a state, uh, like a stepping stone to make music. Exactly. And he just... Okay. And it was really to to buy the physical... Uh, uh, equipment to make music. Um, and, you know, his, but despite that, his game actually did win a competition. So he was a, a competent and great game designer, apparently. I don't know anything about the game that won, but he definitely was making it in his teens, I believe, because he lost interest in programming after this and dropped out of high school. So I think right here you're seeing that this guy had some potential because he was making an award-winning game in high school. Um, And it wasn't until much later that he would apply for a programming role at a company called Interlink. And he used his childhood game as his way to get the job. And what I found so funny is um, when he got the job, he couldn't keep up with the programming because he's been, you know, out of the industry for years. And so they shifted him to the sound division um, yeah. oh. here's a, here's a quote from him. He said, I applied as a programmer and I hadn't programmed anything since I was in elementary school. Everything had changed. That's almost 10 years between when I won and when I was applying for the job. I was like, what is this hard, hard disc? Wow. That's great. What is this MS DOS? Wow. Microsoft has good <laughs> ideas. My boss said, maybe you can't program. I was almost let go. I said, but I can compose. I can do planning. So (laughs) how, George, how is it possible to be hired with so little to no experience based on a game you made a decade or more ago when you were in grade school? How is that? That must be a bad company. Like, no offense to him. You know, I have to probably agree with you on the it's a bad company front because like I feel like a lot of these like video game companies in the 80s and early days were just kind of like put together by these managers that kind of didn't even know the industry themselves. It, it was so new that they right. just hired anyone. They're like, this kid won a competition. Oh, that's it. You're, you're heading the team. Like, I, I wonder how many of the early Japanese developers would have made it in today's standards if they had to work with today's type of video games because it's, like, more complex to make a video game today than it ever was, you know? Right, and I mean, you know, not to talk (laughs) other developers and current events, but you look at Balan Wonder World, and it's kind of an example of two superstars from the Genesis days at Sonic Team who, to be quite honest, are kind of out of step with modern gaming. I mean, no offense to them on that game but it's just when you play it it does not scream these are the people who worked on knights and sonic you know or even billy hatcher i will say that the art design on it is pretty sick and i wish the game that was made around it would have been better i don't know if i could we could fault only those two it does take a lot big team to make these games but yeah you could tell there's something there that definitely isn't up to yuji naka standards for sure absolutely and not to to, you know, bang the new Yuji Naka drum, but like, when has the last time been that he made a great game? I Oof. <laughs> think I, about we, it. We anyway, don't, want to, open, we, we don't good, want to open up that can of worms. Good question to pose there. But um, yeah, in, in my own experience, I mean, I, I work in design and you can say on your resume that you've worked in, um, I don't know, like, what's an example? Flash. I mean, Flash is dead now, but, you know, I, I would there would be places where like, oh, it says here that you've done video editing and Flash and After Effects. And I'd be like, yes. And to be quite honest, I have. But if you if you started me day one and they're like, all right, start working in these programs hardcore, I'd be like, I'm not actually very good at them. <laughs> um, and so that's, and that's why you look at what they've created. And I think that's why it's such a surprise for Kenji Eno because he's like, 
here's the game I made. And I wonder if they ask him, hey, is this 10 years old and have you made anything since? And do you know anything about current software? I mean, it, it must have just, they must have just been desperate for game developers, to be honest. Um, but the the good news is that he did stick around there a little bit. At Interlink, he produced Ultraman Club 2 for the Famicom. And he quit soon after, <laughs> citing the company's quick expansion. So they gave him a chance. He made a game. And then he goes, this place is growing too fast. I'm out of here. Um, I'm not underground so, enough. Yeah, right? And that's going to kind of be, th- be a theme of his career. Um, in 1989, Eno formed EIM, which stands for Entertainment, Imagination, and Magnificence. <laughs> where he created he created Famicom <laughs> games, two of which made it to the U.S. There was Casino Kid 2 and Panic Restaurant. So have you played either of these games? And if you have, what are your thoughts on them? I have not. I think I've seen Casino Kid 2 uh, pictures of it, but I've never played these games. Have you? I have not. I'm looking at Casino Kid 2, and it's, to be quite honest, just like your basic card yeah. game. Um, Pretty much. Panic Restaurant. Uh I'm actually just looking at... These were games I was meaning to play before we started, but I just did not get around to it. It just looks like your basic platformer. Honestly, it looks like um, that that cooking game, you know, where you run across things, but Mario. So it's okay. like... I mean, nothing exciting. And I've talked to people in preparation for this, and they'd say, oh yeah, Kenji Eno, he made a Famicom game. He made this and that. To be quite honest, when you play these games, nothing about them scream... Kenji Eno, and I think if he were around and you were to ask him, hey, what is your, like, core gameography? Like, what is there? And he probably would not cite these. Um, I don't think he just, would either. No, it just, it seems like they were an ends to uh, a mean, a means to an end, um, where he was just, you know, trying to make it in the industry and, to be quite honest, probably get to the point that he finally made it with D. Where, where I honestly think his career kind of started there, if anything. Mm-hmm. Um, he also worked, I thought this was interesting, he worked on a Superman game for Sunsoft. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, but he's, he, yeah, he soon abandoned it, citing the nature of Superman and how he was unable to design a proper game. And just to take a, a quick break from the notes here, so I think that's really interesting because Superman has long been a franchise that has struggled with games so it's not Eno's problem. Like, Superman is invincible. So how do you make a video game starring an invincible character? Uh, yeah. Do, and you know, they strip been, him of his... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, there's been, there's been studios right now, like, that have been rumored to be working on a, like, Justice League game or, like, a Superman-centric game. And mm-hmm. they never seem to come public because, I like, like he said, it's hard to make a superman game even thinking about it like the batman one makes sense you get upgrades you get better as it goes along there's no flying you just hover it makes sense spider-man makes sense the swinging mechanic Mm -hmm. but yeah flying i don't know just flying is kind of boring to be honest with you if you don't do it right and making a superman game with fighting and all that is just difficult yeah he's overpowered he's perfect in every way so when you make a game you kind of anger the fans because they go where's this power where's that power you you know it's almost like every game they go, oh, everything's kryptonite. So he's he's <laughs> he gets hurt. Um, but interestingly enough, this work actually actually shifted to a game called Sunman, which was finished and apparently never released. But a ROM is out there. But I, I don't really know how you can say there's a ROM out there but not have the ROM in hand. So who knows where it is? Um, Eno had said that including licensed characters in his game made him mentally unstable and wow. this led to him closing his company and becoming a consultant for an automotive magazine it was what? only through yeah it was only through events with indie game creators that he was inspired to return to the industry so i mean this guy does not he doesn't just talk the talk he walks the walk like when he's like this is too much for me and you go you know like you've had those friends or you've had those moments yourself where you're like this is too much. But have you ever gone, this is too much, I quit everything. I'm done. You know? No. <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's it's kind of sad in retrospect because he, he died of hypertension. And here he's saying it made him mentally unstable to work on licensed 
games. And I feel for the guy because a lot of people had to work on licensed games for sometimes years, decades before they get to make, you know, the big game they really want to make. And I mean, would it, I mean, as you as a designer, if, if like, DC Comics came up to you and they're like, work on our character. And then you start designing <laughs> it. They're like, sorry, Batman doesn't stand like that. That's so lame. Come on, get a cooler stance. And then they start screwing with you. Would you care too much? I mean, I guess it would bother me. I, I personally have worked on a lot of big brands. And I always found those to be the most difficult jobs. Because, of course, the the owners are very, very picky. Um, and... That's kind of why I enjoy working in what I work now, which is education, because it's not like people are going to complain with how you sell education as much because it's not <laughs> a brand. Um, yeah. So, I mean, and, and you see that in the game industry, too. You see people who end up working in communication or education. We had that with the Seaman creator. We had that with um, Tom Kalinske. He went on to Leapfrog. So, yeah. You know, it's just, it seems like education sometimes becomes the, the, I don't know if it's a fallback, but it just becomes a very comfortable thing for a lot of people or communications. Um, I recently learned, you know, the company that made You Don't Know Jack? Yeah. Remember that? They, yeah. they exist in Chicago. They now make like software for HR companies that are like, I don't know if it's AI, but it's like a chat. So they went from making these crazy video games to making software for like HR companies. It's very That's strange. Weird. And so when I hear Kenji Eno had a mental a mental break and became a consultant for an automotive magazine, I'm just like, wow. That was that's a big shift. Um, I think I think that's the depression he needed. He needed to work in the automotive industry in a magazine to get depressed enough to make something like B. <laughs> That could be it. Um, because after that, he made his return with the founding of Warp. Um, and the studio started with a team of six. And if you uh, watch the credits for the games, he actually, especially for D, he shows photos of the developers. I think D shows at least seven or eight people. So it's a very small team. And then it, it's a larger team when it comes to like external people, uh, music, things like that. Um, Enemy Zero actually has the credits on the back. So those are the names of the people who worked on the game. So, I mean, for as, uh, I guess, unstable as the guy could be, he seemed very appreciative of the people who worked for him. I I mean, I've never seen credits on the back for a team like that. Never. So that's, never that's very nice. And including photos too. Like this is an industry that would be like, oh, your name is you, you number two, you two. And that's all you can call <laughs> yourself. And here with Kenji, yeah. you know, he's like, put your picture up there. And so I really appreciate that. That's that's very cool of him. Um, but And I think this really worked for him, too, because Eno personally handled planning, production, direction, and sound. However, programming and design, you know, which were kind of the things that caused him to have his mental break, was left to the rest of the team. So in this case, I kind of see him as like a Yu Suzuki, where he was not really hands-on with the 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 coding and the numbers and all those crazy things. He was more involved with planning, production, direction, and even sound. Mm. Um, and with that in mind, I, I, I do think he could have been like a Yu Suzuki if he had continued making games. Um, initially, the studio was only to create games for the American-developed 3DO. Um, <laughs> this sort of strange decision was actually characteristic of Eno. Warp, oh, yeah. only, Warp only developed eight games, with their gameography growing only by a little bit when you count re-releases and unreleased titles. Only four of their games released to the West, and they largely supported less popular hardware like the 3DO, the Saturn, Panasonic M2, and the Dreamcast. Hey, that's not less popular. Um, Especially compared to the <laughs> Panasonic and the 3DO. I mean. Right, exactly. <laughs> Um, aside from a puzzle game titled Trip D, which was a Puyo Puyo style game for the 3DO, a sumo robot fighter, and a Mahjong sim, which I actually, actually kind of want to play because it's, it's, all right, so it's about young women being <laughs> saved by perverts through Mahjong. Sounds so, about right. 
<laughs> right. So, well, I kind of see those as kind of like the un-Kenji games. That little twist kind of makes me wonder if maybe we should include it. Um, Warp did push unique titles, which experimented with horror, violence, sexuality, and sound design. Uh, Warp also featured unique bonus items with their games, including strange art cards for D. So let's take a look at those, actually, instead of uh, oh. just talking about it. So I got them here. They're in a little packet. Look at that. Oh. And then you have Regret. You could descri describe it for the audio listeners. Uh, sorrow. So it has these like grim pictures of characters from the game. Madness, which shows... It's, the it's like CGI rendered, renders. Yeah, pain, which is like a, a skull. Fear, which is uh, like a suit of armor. Hope, which is the protagonist. And then we're back to regret there. So that's that's kind of cool. He's got little, like, uh, I don't know, emotional flashcards. Um, and then inside Enemy Zero, there wasn't really anything interesting, but there was like a... Um, the manual is actually like folded like a um like that so I, I don't really know what you call it like back forth back forth uh it's just like a uh, long strip of paper pretty much I, I i forgot what it's called but there's a name for that but yeah yeah and it's got it's got silver ink which is kind of cool um and then there's real sound which is a game for the blind which i think you might cover on yours because i don't really talk about it too much mm -hmm. um but this has some really cool things. So it comes with um, some cards with Braille on them. So like D, it has these like art cards with Braille. And then it has, this is really cool. It has seeds. So he wants yeah. you to go like plant something. You ever plant one? I have not. Do you I think, think they they're, they've been long dead. Yeah. I don't think I plants assume. last that long. And then, unfortunately, Ooh. the American D, he didn't really put any in, anything into it. But, I don't know, maybe he did, did you, the Japanese. Did you ever look up what plants the seeds were? Or is it even I, legal now to do that, though? Like, sending Japanese uh, plant seeds uh, overseas? <laughs> you know, that's a very good point. I might have, like, broken international law here. But, believe it or not, a packet of seeds in real sound is not the craziest thing. In fact, um, he included a condom. With the mini game collection Short Warp, which was a limited run that he autographed every copy of. Uh, so, what do you think? So, he wants us to plant a tree, but he wants us to stop having babies. So, what is he trying to tell us, George? That uh, global warming is a real problem and uh, we gotta plant more trees and stop banging. <laughs> right? <laughs> is that it? I guess so. Well, I'm not good at that. Um,. Yeah, so uh, that's that's kind of what we've got so far. And George, you're going to pick up the ball and run with it on the next episode where we talk about D2. But now let's talk about the game itself. So around this time, Eno and Warp, they released D, which was really kind of their breakout game. Like I said, Eno had a pretty big history in games, but D really feels like the start of his career, the reboot of his career. And... D, so the game star is a character named Laura Harris, who is played by a digital actress named Laura, who also appears in the game's Enemy Zero. So you can see her here on the cover. And then she also appears in D2. Though I would argue it's hard to tell that's the same person because I think rendering uh, and graphics just improved with each game. So it's almost like, you know, you look at her even between D and Enemy Zero on the same console and it's just like looks like two different people um but yeah I she gonna, i was in mm -hmm. i was going to tell you about laura the you know the digital actress aspect of it is this the first yeah. time you've ever seen a company straight up tell you this is an actress a digital rendering of an actress and she, like I, the first time i remember it vividly being marketed that way was uh space channel 5 with lou la la that she was kind of like a an idol or a uh Pop star. Well, you yeah. know, it's interesting you mentioned that because I was thinking about that too. And I can't think of any games that say this is an actor. Instead, they say this is the character. They, like you'd never say mm -hmm. Sonic the Hedgehog is an actor playing Sonic the Hedgehog. Or you wouldn't say Lara Croft is an actress playing Lara Croft. Though I feel like with Lara Croft, they did that a lot because they would do her in magazine shoots 
and like posing and things where she seemed like a character outside of the game. Um, mm-hmm. And that's the only one I can really think of. But what I find so interesting is that she's the only thing linking these three games. And so, you know, we're covering D and D two, but there are people who believe that enemy zero is the second game and D two is the third game. What's your take on that? I, ha- I haven't played, you know what, this is going to be embarrassing. I've never beaten D two. So like that was something I was going to do these last two weeks. I, I, I'm, this close, like this close to finishing up everything I need to finish up in Yakuza like mm-hmm. a dragon. Like mm-hmm. I just need the last dungeon, which is uh, the grind is ridiculous, but I haven't played it. So I, I don't have an actual, you know, opinion on that. Um, what is your take on it? Um, I mean, I can see where people are, are coming from, I guess in terms of like a trilogy of games starring Laura, you could say that, but in terms of D it's obvious that D two is the sequel even though there's no connective tissue outside of Laura herself. Um, but I mean, he would have called it D3 if that was the case. Um, and as far as like digital actresses and actresses, I did pose the question if we can think of any other examples in video games. And there was one that kind of came to mind and you just mentioned Yakuza. I kind of feel like the character uh, of Kazuma is kind of an actor because we have seen him appear in period pieces, you know, where it's mm-hmm. like the Kenzin games and Ishin. And then we've seen him, um, what else have we seen him do? Oh, uh, Dead Souls, which is a non-canon yeah, game. Souls. So, and and he, his likeness, unlike a lot of the other characters, his likeness is very unique. It's a digital character. It's not like they had an actor that looked like him exactly. Correct? it's so, kind of based on someone but it definitely doesn't look like him at all it's like right kind of like those youtubers that have the anime pictures where they look way better in, in, the, right. in the render obviously it's that yeah so i guess i guess what you could say as a digital actor is anything where that it doesn't really resemble anyone in the real world and they the video games will sometimes break out of the game universe and utilize the character for other things and in that case of course I would say Kazuma is kind of similar to Laura in that he has played different roles in different games, but it still looks like him. It's not like Sonic in the Black Knight where it's like Sonic's like, that's Knuckles, but he doesn't seem to recognize me, you know. Um, Let's move on to the other cast because it's going to take a long time to talk about these guys. So we have Dad and Mom. And that's pretty much it. That's Laura's father and mother. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That's it. That's it. I like that the dad is just like, I don't know, the most random looking, like, they didn't even give him hair. They're like, it's too much work. Yeah. That's good enough. <laughs> I, I was, <laughs> was going to tell you, your camera's glitching out again. You have to restart it. I don't know what's up with Discord today. There you go. I'm going to tell you something right now. It's D. I'm messing with you. This is psychological. Oh, okay, here we go. All right. Okay. Go. Sorry. <laughs> so, do you think the game benefits from having such a small cast, or could it have used more characters? Well, as we know, the game is super low budget, and uh, I think the minimalist approach is pretty good because you don't have to like explain a bunch of other characters. The game's not that long, and what it does have, it does have like. Every character is condensed, you know? Like, there's a reason the mom is there. There's a reason the dad is there. There's a mystery behind right. all of this that she has to solve. And it's all connected to her past. So she is the main character in this, obviously. It's like, basically, when you... Like, her having a realization of her life not being what she thought it, thought it was going through this mm-hmm. uh, ordeal. So I think having it small makes sense because it just needs to be the persons that affects this person's life, the mom and the dad in this situation, I guess she'd have no brothers or anything. No. Yeah. And it's not like there's a guy she encounters halfway through the game who like helps her through it. There's not like a police detective at the beginning. Who's like, Laura, you must get in there and figure out what's going on. Um, So in that case, yeah, it's very simple in terms of plot. It's very simple in terms of the amount of characters and gameplay is simple too. So players move Laura around the game's environments in a first-person view, and you can 
uh, see that if, George, you're playing the Nintendo Complete, <laughs> oddly named oh, Nintendo yeah. Complete channel, playing a Saturn game. But um, we thank them for their, their efforts here. So you can see the game kicking off, and we'll just let it play while we talk for a bit. Um, there are puzzles to solve and plot points to discover as you interact with objects and enter spaces the twist to the gameplay. And I discovered this when I started playing it uh, last week is that players only have two real-time hours to complete the game, there are no save options, and the biggest thing is there's no pause button. So this oh, is God. a game you need to put aside two hours. It's like it's like a movie playing in yeah. the theater where you can't pause the movie. If you have to go pee, you got to go run and go pee and come back. Um, thankfully, it's not like enemies will attack you while you're away, but the clock is ticking. So... What are your thoughts on not only the time limit, but the inability to pause? And how do you think this gameplay element enhances the experience? I don't think it enhances it to, per se, because I think as gamers, we're kind of used to having the pause button, right? Even when we were kids, we would be like, Mario game, huh? Or Sonic, oh, pause. Oh, I gotta go to the bathroom. Oh, I gotta go get my juice or whatever. Anything, or somebody hit, somebody's at the door. It sucks when you have to explain to your parents. I remember trying to explain to my uh, mom that, like, I couldn't stop playing Fantasy Star Online. There was no pause button. I couldn't just take out the trash. Um, <laughs> and that was, like, a novel concept back then. It's like, of course there's a pause button. What are you talking about? So, like, just imagine in, like, 96 trying to explain that to your parents. Right. Yeah. Um, so it, it was kind of annoying at the time because nobody's done it, but I think he did it on purpose to uh, kind of force people to finish the game in one sitting and uh, enjoy it like a movie because that's kind of what he was trying to do in you know an interactive movie. Yeah, and I mean, I I would argue it does enhance the experience just because it once you start it, just like Laura, you're like you're in it. You know, it's not like you have the uh, luxury of pausing well in real life or in the game's real life. She is stuck there and really has to rush and, you know, defeat, you know, the, the bad guy. Um, but you just are like, Oh, I'm going to pause it and go take a shit. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it does lead, it does lend to, you know, kind of the, the tension. Um, it makes you not wander around so much and like stare at the environments um, you're not going to go, oh, yeah, what was in that soup bowl way back and, like, backtrack? Like, you're like, no, I got to get this game done. I'm, I've am i got 30 minutes left, and there's no way that I'm going to complete it. Um, so in that, in that regard, I, I think that is interesting. Like, I'm trying to think of any other games that have done this, and the only things I can really think of are games that are, like, multiplayer where you aren't able to pause because it's, like, an online game. Um, yeah. So like you said, Fantasy Star Online. Um the story itself, it begins in 1997 Los Angeles. Laura Harris receives a call from the police telling her her father, Dr. Richter Harris, has killed several people and is currently in a standoff inside a hospital. So Laura rushes to the scene and enters the hospital and inside she sees the gruesome sight of her father's victims. And upon covering her eyes, she opens them and finds herself in a castle. <gasps> And she makes her way through the castle. She experiences flashbacks of her mother being murdered by stabbing and sees visions of her father telling her to leave. Get out, Laura, go. And if Laura stays too long, she will be trapped in the castle forever and he will eventually come and kill her. So I was, I found that funny because it's like, is she really trapped there forever if he's going to kill her? You're here forever no. and I'm going to come and kill you. <laughs> yeah, it's like pick uh, yeah. one. <laughs> maybe that's yeah. like a loss in translation um i like i said i played the japanese version and i had to just uh check up uh like walkthroughs like this one just to see what some of the the dialogue was it's pretty self-explanatory though once you go through so it is a very import friendly game um now we're going to get into some spoilers here so if you do not want to be spoiled skip ahead maybe five seven minutes um all right so if you are skimming through and watching this and the lizard is on my shoulder, this is the spoiler lizard, um, that means I'm still talking spoilers. When the lizard's gone, then the spoilers will be done. This is something no one's ever done before. This is very Kenji Eno. You know. Yeah. Um, so, spoiler alert. Uh, in the end, Laura finds her father in the top of the castle and learns the truth. She and her father are part of a family family 
of cannibalistic vampires with the family beginning with Dracula. Yes. So it was Laura who killed and ate her mother years ago, and her father removed the memories. Dr. Harris warns Laura one more time to leave, and he turns into a vampire. From here, the player has multiple options for different endings, so if Laura approaches her father, he just eats her. If Laura shoots her father, she will then kill him and stop the transformation. And I thought the funniest part, I mean, no offense, but was when the father was dying in her arms, and he's, he's like, thank you for killing me. I, I, as a doctor, I just, I had to see what transforming into a vampire was like, but you were right to kill me. I was going to eat you. I, it was stupid of me. Uh, and then he's like, idiot. I know. And he goes, one, one more thing, Laura, remember. And then he dies. Um, and upon his death, the castle fades away and they return to the hospital. So, what a twist ending. So what are your thoughts on the ending to D? I think it had a pretty good payout. I think the whole idea that they're cannibals uh, was pretty cool. Um, and pretty dark ending that she's the one that killed her mother and all this. And that like they're obviously leading you. I mean, her father was crazy. Listen, I mean, let's not get yeah. that twisted. I mean, the guy got – he's like, ah, I almost ended the human race out of uh, sheer curiosity. <laughs> it's like, all right, dude, you <laughs> piece of crap. Anyway. Um, right. So I, I like the ending. Um, I thought it was dark. The whole thing has like this weird dark family uh, environment and like – I don't know, trauma of your childhood being resurfaced as an adult, which kind of makes you question a lot about e uh, Eno and all that because he was kind of a depressive guy. Um, but I thought it was pretty dark and twisted, and it was pretty it, – it made you really go, okay, so that's why the game is called D, and it's not just doing it to be annoying and hard to find in stores or anything. It has a purpose, obviously, the ending. Yeah, and I mean it's worth pointing out too that um... – and Eno's own mother disappeared during from his life during his second year of elementary school. I don't know if she passed away or what, but she was gone from his life at that time. So the idea of not having a mother is really something that comes from Eno's own experiences, relying on memories. And I, I feel sad for the guy just because did he think he was the reason her mother, his mother went away. Like it could have been, you know, he might've blamed himself. So the idea of having the protagonist, you know, killing her own mother and then the father being the one to like, you know, remove her memories is, is dark. Um, as for what D stands for, I think we kind of figured that out. Now it stands for Dracula. And mm, it's, as we know, there are a lot of games titled Dracula, especially releasing around this time. There was Bromp Stoker's, Dracula releasing in theaters. There was a Sega CD game. Uh, I think SNES and Genesis had games too. There was um, there were two Dracula games. So D is a smart title because I honestly still don't associate D with Dracula when I see the game. Um, I just think, oh, it's it's D, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, it just it's become its own little name, so it, it doesn't stand for anything to me. But the fact that it stands for Dracula is always something that I go, oh yeah. Huh. Um, so that's that's the end for spoilers. I'll put the spoiler lizard away. Um, so if you're joining us now, <laughs> after skipping out on the spoilers, um, the first major release from Warp D was developed over the course of one year. The concept was actually inspired by a series of games called the Transylvania Trilogy, which were a series of graphic adventure games developed by Antonio Antio Chia and published by Polarware. So, uh, George, if you want to bring up the footage of that game, I have Thank a you. playthrough here. Um, Let's see. I'll fast forward some. Yeah, there you go. Oh, you don't like that sweet startup where it's like all this weird, like, glitchy code? That's my favorite. <laughs> I love the loading says the comprehend. Yeah. I like it when the colors in. It's pretty sweet actually. Oh, I remember when games did that. It was like filling like a paint bucket fill. On, yeah, cuz um, like uh the ram was filling up or whatever. Oh, that's so cool. I remember that. That takes me back. Um yeah, so as you can see here it's like it's a text adventure. Um but I I can see kind of the D resemblance here. You know, it's just 
you're just thrown into this very dark, creepy place, like a stump is the first thing you see. Um, and then you're just moving around outside, north, south, east, west. Have you played a lot of text adventures? I have not. I never grew up with a computer to play these kind of games, so I, I just never experienced them. I do know that they were they used to be like really popular, but like you had mm-hmm. to have like a five thousand dollar computer, right? I don't know how yeah. much they cost. Yeah, <laughs> well, I don't know if they cost that much, but I was I was into them for a bit. I've never completed them. They're very difficult, especially ones where you die like every five seconds. Um, I have played, I don't know if I have it in here. No, I ha- I've played the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy text adventure game. Um, I've played Hugo's House of Horrors, which was actually the Hugo trilogy. Mm-hmm. Um, those are fantastic if you can ever like emulate them. You move around with the arrows, but then when you approach characters, they'll ask you questions and then you can type in answers and you can say some naughty things, which is pretty funny. Like, take off your clothes, baby, you know, things like that. And they're like, no way, she slaps you. Um, so those are kind of fun, but here, uh, you know, I, I definitely get the D, the idea that he got from D the gun in this game, I think is the same gun, the pistol. It's like an old fashioned pistol. You see that? Um, I I didn't see the pistol. I did see that they, they, they typed it in, but yeah. 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 So it's, it's kind of interesting. That might, might've been a little nod to the Transylvania game. So I mean, do you see the do you see the uh, inspiration? I mean, obviously, D's way advanced compared to this. Yeah. But like people that complain about D, I, I've I've met people that hate D. I don't know what they expected, but for the genre that it's trying to basically revive at the time on the 3DO and on, later on on Saturn and PlayStation, it makes sense mm-hmm. for what it was. And it was literally super advanced. I think even even right now when we watch the gameplay, I'm amazed that they did 3D renders that early with just nine people like you yeah. gotta understand this is when like toy story came, barely came out and these guys are doing an indie game with renders that uh aren't you know as great but they're pretty great compared to a lot of early cgi we've seen absolutely and let's talk about the the development so there were three phases there was the adventure game structure the story creation and then the addition of violence so um, I guess if you can imagine, the, he probably sat down and was like, all right, the game begins at a castle. And then you go through this room and there's like this trap there. So you got to go back. So it was really probably them mapping out the castle, figuring out what room led to what. And then I think just getting to the top of the castle just seems like a obvious idea, you know, for the end of the game. From there, the story creation. So I, I'd have to wonder if he maybe from there was like, oh, you're transported to the castle and it's your father and your mother and got all this. And then your dad's at the top of the castle and that's the thing. Um, And then from there, the addition of violence. So they'd probably be like blood, blood here, blood there, blood in this part, her head comes off, you know, (laughs) it's just, uh, it's just a retelling of Donkey Kong, but with a father on the top of the place and (laughs) pretty much childhood trauma. (laughs) And yeah, and so what I find so interesting is the adventure gameplay was largely completed before the story even began. So what he had to do is use the flashbacks that you see throughout the game to add plot points. So it was it was truly like just a basic adventure game through a castle that he then layered the story on top of. And then he layered the violence and cannibalism and everything on top of that. Um, the FMV animation was actually created on Amiga 4000 computers. I thought that was an interesting fact. So, I mean, we're, we're not game designers, but we've played enough games. What do you think is the smarter way to go about things? By developing the story before the gameplay or developing the gameplay and then working a story around it? This is where, I don't know, I guess a lot of uh, Japanese and Western developers differ. I think in in Japan, I think they like to make the gameplay first, a lot of developers, and then revolve around a story around it. And um, I think that works better, in my opinion, because in the end of the day, when you're playing a video game, you're going to have to play the game. (laughs) So, like, it's not like a movie where, where you, it's like all shot and it's all based around the story mostly usually a uh, movie is based around its story sometimes it could be cool purple guys invading earth and that's cool too but uh mostly it's around the story so like 
I think it, for gameplay like this, it makes sense that you want to have a solid gameplay structure that makes you feel like you're moving and progressing through this castle instead of just going, well, we can't have a castle because it makes no sense. Uh, because the story says that she's confronting her father. It should be an office built, and then it just becomes right. complicated. But yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with the, the way they went about this. I think game design first and foremost, uh, is the most important thing. I mean, we're playing games. So to restrict yourself because, oh, the story doesn't go here, so we can't really do our sewer level or something like that. Mm. Um, you know, I I know people complain um, when the Sonic games don't make sense because they're like, well, how did I get from here to here? And it's like, because they shuffled the levels around, they didn't care. They were just like, what, from a gameplay progression perspective, is more fun. That was what they were interested in. Not, oh, can we tie a cutscene from a carnival to a snowy mountain? No, just just have it happen. Um, and I, I think it's, I, I like that more. I mean, I'm not going to slam the Uncharted games, but it's very clear like in Uncharted 4, I think it is, where it's like he's relaxing at home and then he goes upstairs and is like looking through some boxes. Like, that's not a, I mean, that's a video game, but that's not a video game, you know, capital V, capital G. That's a story. And then they build gameplay aspects into it. So they're like, oh, he plays Crash Bandicoot and then he goes upstairs and like goofs around with a pop gun, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, that's fun. That's cool. I like those games uh, from what I've played, but it's very clear that story came first and then they built the gameplay around it. Um so speaking of story, the story was largely inspired by the Dracula story, but additional violence and cannibalism was added to make the game more exciting. So Eno believed the game's violence was too scary and taboo, so he kept it largely a secret from others, including those who worked with him at Warp. Eno feared that these elements would prevent the game from being published, so to circumvent this... He created a clean version of the game and intentionally sent it late to the publisher for approval. And because he was late in submitting the game, he would have to hand deliver the game to the manufacturer. And on his way to deliver the game, which required him taking a flight to the United States, he swapped the clean version out for the real version and had it published. Um, what the yeah, hell, so dude? No. Imagine, like... imagine if any studio did such a thing today because this isn't one man this is a studio working with a claim he put his career on the line here and i mean do you think he the risk paid off i i do but yeah i i mean you know we, we follow modern gaming news people are like oh they put they put that cyberpunk game out too early and it's glitchy but can you imagine if they were like here's cyberpunk and then they were like what the hell? What is this game? It comes out and there's like, like I don't know, full on nudity and like sex scenes. Well, there is already in that game, but <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean. Like something just completely insane gets shoved into the game, and they're like, "Oh, it was the head of the studio. He put it in without telling anybody. He'd be uh, fired. He'd be forced 100%. out. There would be, you know, it's crazy." And this is kind of what made him a rebel, I guess. But, like, I agree with you 100%. And it kind of did happen recently in a way with... I mean, if the rumors are correct about Konami, but, like, supposedly uh, Kojima or whatever, before he got fired, uh, the Silent Hills demo that he put out, supposedly yeah. he never did it with Konami's p p uh, permission. He just talked to people in Sony that he knew, and then he got the demo put out. And that's why Konami got like t uh, cut ties with him and like basically kicked him out and shunned him from the company because the, he was doing stuff without the publisher's permission. Because apparently Konami wanted to like pull out of console games, so he was like, "Oh, I'll just make a game that everyone wants." And then yeah, that's funny. But if that's true, it's basically like this, and th he's one of the biggest names in the company, and he got fired. So I would assume that if Eno wasn't the lead of warp he probably would have been fired <laughs> i mean i think yeah. if, if me and you did this in our job we would be 100 percent fired <laughs> without a second yeah. thought yeah pretty much i mean i i like i said i work in design and i will create something it'll go off for approvals people will approve it 
and then it comes back to me, I package it and send it out to the printer. I send it out to whoever's making it. I can never imagine a time where I would get the thing back. It's been approved by other people. And then I add something to it and send it out like that. Like a I don't know if dick. I would get, f- <laughs> I don't know if I'd get fired. Well, I would for that. But I don't know if I'd get fired, <laughs> but I would definitely be told, do not ever, ever do that ever again. You know, or <laughs> yeah. in the case of some things, yeah, I probably would get fired. But, um, you know, I mean, he, he was stressing about other things. So he said that should the game be a failure, failure, he would quit game development altogether. So, I mean, take this man seriously because he's done it before. Uh, however, thankfully for him and us in Japan, D was a success. The game sold a million copies and even had a special edition re-release, though not on the Saturn. Ooh. Um of the platforms the game released to, the 3DO version was cited as one of the console's best games, and the Saturn version reached the top of the sales charts for the first week. And here's uh, here's what they were saying at the time. So GamePro called it a frightening work of art. Ooh. NextGen said, This is without a doubt the most heavily atmospheric and creepy title to date for the 3DO, or for that matter, any home system. And they noted that the puzzles are just challenging enough to satisfy, but not so difficult as to com- to impede your progress for very long, which I appreciate. I hate a hard-ass game. I want something I can at least complete. Yeah. Um, Sega Saturn magazine speculated that the upcoming Resident Evil would outclass the game, which they were right about, um, but as of then, it was the best horror game on the market. The Saturn version was also noted for having very short load times compared to the 3DO version. And as far as, yeah, see, we win. Um, As far as criticism, reviewers noted the poor English voice acting and said the game was low challenge and short in length. So what's your own opinion on the game? And do you think the reviewers at the time were fair in their assessment? I would say pretty fair because they still make games like this. There's an indie game that came out that's kind of like like the I forgot what it was called. I, I literally saw a streamer playing it and I was like, I'm going to bring this up on the podcast. And I totally forgot the game the game's name. But hmm. they still make these type of games, you know, where they're like indie horror movie games where you it's like pre-rendered and stuff like this. So like. I think this is fair because I've seen people complain way harder about this now than back then. And especially when they're considering that they're charging you at this time, it was like how much $80, $70 per a Sega Saturn game when it came out. And it's only two hours long. I think if it came out now that it's a two hour game instead of like a eight hour movie, people would complain about it because we're so used to having these cinematic games at least try to aim to be 10 hours. And two hours, pretty short, I would say. But again, we're talking about uh, the first 3D games and how, you know, this came in two discs. So on the Sega Saturn. So for the time, I would say, yeah, they were fair. I would say saying that, you know, being two hours is a little short and that's a negative. I think that's that's fair for the consumer. I don't think it bothers me personally, but I could see people getting bothered. Oh, for sure. I mean, in my case, like before I knew the two hour limit, I saw two discs and I thought this was like an epic game. I thought like eight hours or something crazy. But you got to remember FMV takes up a lot of space. Even Night Trap, I believe, was two discs. So, you know, it is uh, what it is. I think this is more of like a sequel or a spiritual successor to what they were trying to do at Digital Pictures kind of thing, you know, but with CGI renders. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, 3DO fans, they, like I said, they lucked out. There was a special edition release. It was a director's cut called D's Diner, (laughs) which contained additional content and a CD soundtrack. And you can watch long plays. I actually am clicking around on one. It looks like the same game. There's nothing jumping out at me that looks new or different. Maybe there's some like new scenarios. I did notice that the end credit photos for the developers are updated uh that's something but i i'm not exactly sure what if anything is in a director's cut for a game that the guy pretty much hijacked and released what he wanted to release from the beginning um but now we're going to get into some drama here so the playstation Uh version it became a point of contention for eno and i don't blame him when i read this i was like sony what the hell 
So Sony did not produce enough copies to satisfy pre-orders. So around 100,000 copies were ordered, but Sony gave other titles priority in manufacturing. So Sony told Eno that they only produced 40,000 units, which upset him. I mean, I'd be upset too, but it gets worse. So the truth is that they only made 28,000 units, which made him even more upset. I mean, I'd be pissed off. People, 100,000 people want to buy my game. Sony's like, uh, we only made 40,000. He goes, what the f-? And then they go, actually, actually. it was only 28,000. We, we lied to you. <laughs> so not only did we under-deliver, but we lied to you. Like, this is a game that he that 100,000 people could be playing. And they were like, ah, oh, only 28,000. Um, this made him even more upset. And upon learning this, Eno vowed revenge by making his future games all Sega exclusives. Thank you. Um, and in true Kenji Eno fashion, and there's no footage of this, I looked for it, I would have loved to see this. Maybe we make a, a biopic just so we can make this this scene. Yeah. Um, he made the Saturn exclusive announcement at a Sony event by having the Sony logo morph into the Sega logo. So, oh, God. Um. You know, I mean, this is a guy who, when he says, I am having a nervous breakdown, he is actually having a nervous breakdown. This is a guy who says, I quit the game industry if this goes wrong. He, he st- you know, he does it. So this is not a man that you cross and this is not a man that you piss off. I mean, in all the pictures, he seems like a very happy guy. And, and as evidenced, he treats his staff great. So I'm sure he's a great guy. But if you cross him... You will be destroyed, <laughs> you know. I, I feel like uh, he's the a perfectionist, and Sony got in his way of his. Like, I mean, see it. I think this is like a huge issue with developers back in the '90s. Even Sega, like their own in-house developers, got screwed over randomly, and they would have fights about shipping numbers on the Sega Saturn. So the fact that Sega didn't screw him over was kind of a that said something at least. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, I mean, what do you think, though, about Sony treating him like this? Like, is is that seems like something they would do? It just seems really trashy. To me, I mean, at the time, they had so much, like, third-party support. I'm assuming they really didn't believe in these, like, 3DO-type titles, these M- FMV titles, because if you think about it, Sega did promote some of these kind of titles. They promoted some of the digital picture titles on the Sega CD uh, mm-hmm. I've never seen Sony go, hey, look, we have FMV games on our uh, console ever. and But they do promote other stuff like Metal Gear Solid or uh, Final Fantasy VII. They uh, put big promotional materials to sell the PlayStation 1. So maybe they just didn't believe in D and thought it was just like a... Uh, maybe didn't really like FMV games that much as a publisher. I think that's probably what it was more than anything. But yeah, it's tragic. So... Let's take a look at some print ads from around the world. Um, so first up, we have one from GamePro here. Mm. It has the letter D. It has her crying, her black tears, which is a real photo. It doesn't look anything like Laura, just some woman. Yeah. Um, I wonder what that's for- about. It says, forgive me, Father, for I am sin instead of I oh. have sinned. Ooh. Pretty good marketing considering, you know, the, you know. Um what I find interesting down here is it says D, damnation, demo. <laughs> <laughs> and it says call 516-759. Let's call them right now. Let's oh, see if God. we can get a demo it's of D. Be a, it's going to be a sex line. 516-759-7800. All right, you ready? I'm going to call them. I'm going to put it on speaker here. Good. Can't wait for them to pick up. I'm pretty sure it's going to be the D demo hotline. You are calling New York from Martial Arts Academy. How may I help you? Hi, I'm sorry. I have the wrong number. I was looking for D. Okay. Oh. No worries. No D. This is a company, right. sir. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I was calling for the D demo, but it doesn't sound like it's the same place. You called the Martial Arts Academy, sir. Oh. Oh, well, that's interesting. Okay. I guess it's not D. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for calling. <laughs> wow. wow. It's a Martial Arts Academy. 
while I mean we could learn martial arts and maybe they got the demos in the back somewhere. I was nice her, though, right? I, I was you, I was friendly. You should have told the lady, <laughs> "Hey, um, does anybody ever call you for D demos by any chance?" So, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't want to get in trouble, but like I want people to call them and ask for the D demo. Oh God, don't poor lady. That lady sounded don't too nice. Don't do it. Leave her alone. She seemed nice. But wait, I, my question is: This is a martial arts academy. It must be. Yeah. Where's five one six? This is completely derailing the episode. But hey, we're we're uh, only an hour in, so it's not like we're running long. That's interesting. So this is New York. So the building was in New York where they were handing out the demos. I just called a martial arts academy at 10 p.m. their local time, and they and picked they're up. Open. Yeah, like they're just right. They're, they're just waiting for the kids, dude. Martial arts. Wait, is why are they open? It's pan height of a pandemic, and you're open making calls at a martial arts academy, and you're not giving me my D demo. So it's the <laughs> Long Island Martial Arts Adult and Kids Programs. Wait, they, they fight adults versus kids. We finally Adults found and our... kids. Oh, what mind. is this? Five one six. I don't want to fight. That's so adults. strange. So a number for a martial arts academy was giving out D demos back in the <laughs> mid nineties. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not how it went. I'm pretty sure the company went under. And they just it must be. You know what it must be. It must be like a strip mall, and it was a company that was like a distributor of like discs and things. I'm assuming so. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just. I'm kind of fascinated with this now because they were open. So you now you think what that? They, what do you, you think the martial arts students made the D demo disc? I'm. I don't know. I mean, what are their hours, <laughs> George? It's what a, if that wasn't because why would a martial arts studio be open right now unless that was? You you think that was like their a line, ghost? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Like All right, let's like let's move on. Uh, the next one we got is um, from Game Players. So this one, uh, it says, Solving the mystery means visiting the dark pit of your soul. The new genre of interactive horror, says Game Fan. And, and you can't really read it here, but it says, like, D is demonic, D is something, D is destiny, D is delirium. Really so that's... That's kind of interesting. Like, see, they're they're clearly playing off of like, what does D stand for? The last one said, "Damnation" and "demo." <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, and, I I, yeah. I think that these ads do a good job of playing up all the mysteries in the game, and they're like actually really well like done in the in how in the context of what the game you're actually playing is because like. All these things right here is like, what is D? Obviously, that's the whole point of the game. What What is D? <laughs> and yeah, they tell you D? kind of in the end. In, in a way, I guess. But yeah, yeah in I a think way. it's cool. Yeah. Um, and then the next one we have here uh, is a UK one. I didn't see another piece to the spread. I have to imagine there must be because it's just like solving the mystery means visiting the dark pit of your soul again. Yeah. Um, mm. And some screenshots. I mean, maybe this was the ad. Maybe you're like, what is it? What is the game? You know? It, it doesn't have the crying woman on this one either. That's the that's the weird part. It doesn't. No, it seems like the environment was really the UK uh, uh, thing that they wanted to highlight. And then finally, we have the Japanese two-page ad, which shows the stylistic D, which you can also see on the cover here. It's like a DuckTales D. And it's yeah. got Laura peeking through, I think. Laura and her father. Yeah, I think it's her, your father, yeah. Yeah. And it's like a shattered That's... mirror for the D, and it has like yeah. this like maroon red. Kind of reminds me of the uh, Persona 5 aesthetic, kind of, a little bit. The red that they have. Yeah, it's interesting. Bit. I mean, I like it. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Japan definitely had a totally different vibe, though, compared to the American ones, where it was like... They played up the horror and the cr- and the darkness, and this one is like more bright. Yeah, hmm. yeah, interesting. Um, so now talking about, I guess, modern day. So D, it has lost some of its appeal in recent years. Those glowing review scores and, and uh, comments we read earlier do not apply to today. A lot of retro reviews and retrospectives are less favorable to the game. It's often cited as being a quintessential example of a game blending FMV and traditional gameplay, 
and people say it's worthy of being studied, but the game itself is not often cited as being great or even good in and of itself. Uh, the idiots at Game Informer actually said the game was among the worst horror games of all time. Like, come on. And, uh, wow. So, yeah. And I mean, if, if you do want to play it and you don't have a Saturn or a 3DO, there is an MS DOS version that was ported to Steam and GOG in 2016 by Night Dive Studios. I actually did download it. It says it works for Mac, but it does not work for 64 bit Mac. And I think they recently stopped 32-bit support. So if you have an old operating system or an older Mac, you can download it and play it, but it doesn't work on PC. And it's uh, it looks like a competent f- port. So, you know, if you're if you're looking for this game, you want to try it out, it's there. It's, I think, 4 or $5.99. Um, don't call that number for the demo because they are a martial <laughs> arts studio open at 10 p.m. during a pandemic. And they do not... They do not... They're not... Yeah, they're not going to send it out. We tried. They're a martial, <laughs> They're not a martial arts studio either. I think that was Kenji Eno playing a trick on me. I think um, so too. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I don't want to spend a bunch of time discussing why older video games, you know, yada yada, but I, let's get into it. So, uh, uh, so why, George, why is it that older video games, unlike film, are more quick to be trashed by reviewers in the gaming press because they don't hold up to modern games? Why is that? Um, I think it's just an easy target, I guess. When you come in from a totally different generation, maybe, going back, you judge these games a little harder and you uh, expect more gameplay out of them, maybe. I- I've seen the same thing happen a lot with um, the, you know... Um, Night Trap is one of them that I hear people say, like, well, th- there's all these issues. I'm like, well, Night Trap's issues were issues back then even. It was an experiment on doing real, real-time real right. footage. And I think they did a pretty decent job for not having a genre to go at, at, you know through and just, you know, putting it together on tape. I think that right. people... I don't know what they expect from this. I, I I thought it was just a short movie game. I thought it was just a, like as close back then as you get into an indie game release. Um, right. And I just saw it as that and I liked it. I think when people go back and see it and they know that Eno is such a, I guess, popular rock star figure, I think they expect it's going to be one of the most competent put together games <laughs> when he was just really trying to put stuff together and... You know, like you said, it was like they already had the castle in and he was just filling in the blanks with the story. And he made this pretty compelling story of a woman that's unique. Like, can you name anyone that's like Laura? She wasn't really sexual, like sexual fight or anything. Yeah. She was dressed like a normal woman. She wasn't an idol. She wasn't like, she was just a blonde woman. That, kind of generic if so you ask some people. But at this time, right. there was nobody like Laura because it was either Tomb Raider with big old titties or yeah you know you either sexual fi- sexual fighter or she was super tough it was never like just a you know normal woman yeah but that's yeah. that's a great point and you know you brought up night trap that was a game that had issues at the time just in terms of it, it was a little too complex for players it, it kind of just threw you in there and it's like here's a movie playing go um and so, I mean, I, I completely get when you look at a game like Night Trap and say, you know, it had its problems then and it doesn't really hold up now because, you know, it, it's not a very approachable game. But in this case, I mean, nothing about D comes off as broken. Uh, nothing about it comes off as, like, unplayable. It, it, it functions. The game fully functions. Everything that the developers set out to have happen works. It's not like I go, oh man, remember the broken controls in D? Remember how it's impossible to move around and select items and do the puzzles? Like, no, everything works. And there are scary jump scares and there is like a fun twist at the end. So I don't get how you can call it the one of the worst horror games of all time when it very much is a scary game that effectively uses horror, horror elements and it's completely playable. Like I can think of so many games that are broken and not fun, like The Crow and uh, uh, Evil Dead for the Dreamcast. Like there's a Oof. lot of bad horror games out there, 
Um, even games that try to copy Resident Evil. Hell, I would argue the first Resident Evil is pretty rough by today's standards. But, you know, you sit me down to play that or to play D, like a straight port or on the original hardware. And I'll be honest, like D is still very approachable, very playable. And I think that two hour limit really kind of helps because then you're not like, man, I played D and after eight hours I gave up. Like that's if someone says that you know they're lying and they've never played this yeah. game, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you know, I I mean, what are your closing thoughts on D before we move into the Patreon memories, George? What do you got to say? A beautiful relic of its time when people were trying to figure out how to make video gaming more, I guess, adventure, more of like a mist type experience. This has a cool, gory, twisty, dark in some. Cool char- I mean, cool, few character. I mean, just one mm-hmm. character, really. It's Laura. And, I mean, it's just a very nice, minimalistic game that's, I think, worth playing if you're into the history of FMV games. And not even just FMV games, but, like, Japanese developers, at least the indie, smaller uh, ones, for sure. This is one of those games that is a must-play. Absolutely. Yeah, if you want to understand the man... Uh, Kenji Ino, I think picking up D on Steam or maybe tracking down a Saturn version um, or even 3DO if you own that, I I definitely recommend it. And the two hour limit just sweetens the deal because you can't say you don't have time. You don't you can't say, oh, I have time to watch Lord of the Rings, but you can't play D. You got two hours. Come on. It's not going to take that much time. uh, But I only watched Lord of the Rings one time this week. I have to watch it again. (laughs) <laughs> you gotta well you never you might get the alternate ending um yeah. so as mentioned at the top of the show if you support us on patreon at any level your memories will be read at the end uh for this episode we have our good friend daniel andres he has some thoughts on d he says d d what a real interesting game that is i only played through disc one once a couple of years back and it was pretty cool and a little spooky. I don't think I'll have a chance to play through Disc 2, though, for I own a U.S. Saturn, a U.S. version of the game, and I'm playing it on a Japanese Model 2 Sega Saturn. Wait, what's he talking You can't swap discs? Is that what it is? I don't know, um, can't you? I can. Well, I mean, I have a Japanese version of the game, though. Um, nonetheless, it is still a really great game that I really need to experience more of sometime soon. And I said to him... In the comments, if you have a PC, the game is on Steam. And he said, really? Since when? I'll have to check it out when I get home tonight. LOL. So I there we go. Even, I sold sold one I copy of the game. I didn't even know it was on PC either. I was surprised. I was surprised too. I, I saw it on, on the wiki and I was like, let's look that up. Oh, it's still there since 2016. So you have no, no excuse unless you don't own the PC. So... Uh, For that, that wraps up D, but we have D2 in two weeks uh, leading up to the anniversary of Kenji Ino's untimely passing. I wish it was his birth date, but let's be honest, the dude went out at the height of his career, so let's celebrate that and not him being a baby. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Thanks for watching, guys. Catch you guys on the next episode with D2. Bye. Bye. I always found that weird when people celebrate the birth of someone and I'm like, they weren't important as a baby. <laughs> <laughs>